And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PreneurCast. You know, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gosher. How well did that go down? We can talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if we want to. Visit us online at PreneurMarketing.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of PreneurCast with me, Dom Goucher, and him, Pete Williams. How are you, buddy? I am very good, sir. How are you? Mate, fantastic. Doing very, very well. Halfway through my um, No Meat November, which has been an interesting uh, little challenge, but going well so far. No Meat November. Hmm. What's the story with that? Um, I Just back training again for a couple of half Ironmans and a 60-kilometre uh, run or a 40-mile run uh, late March as well. And just been reading a lot um, of some friends' books and some books that they've recommended just around the, the vegan diet and how it's actually... Um, exceptionally good for endurance athletes and just all the health benefits and I've just about finished a, um, a course with Cornell University um, on plant-based nutrition and just sort of really, uh, you know, diving deep into that sort of uh, health and wellness kind of stuff and it's been really interesting and that sort of, yeah, drive me to sort of not be, I probably won't end up being 100% vegan but I think I'm going to be very, very much plant-based, whole food, um, you know foundation to the diet and um, just sort of, you know just sort of kick it off i'll do a uh, no meat november and then a uh, no dairy december so it's uh, it's been interesting wow i was not expecting that answer <laughs> <laughs> wow that's really bad that's, that's huge that's huge that's, yeah it's uh, been that's quite a kind of a, a willpower and habit forming thing yeah yeah, absolutely. I think it's you know it's good to sort of flex those muscles every now and again, but at the same time, it's it's, it's been actually a lot easier than I thought. Um, I think I've been sort of you know reading a lot, a lot of books, um, doing this course with Cornell University. Um, first time I've actually done an official course for a couple of years, which has been interesting, um, and it's sort of made it a bit easier because I've been educating myself along the way. It hasn't just been that oh, I'm just going to go and do it and then you know push through every day because every day I'm reading something more that just reinforces the why. Uh, which I think has been really, really helpful. Absolutely. I just, yeah, I would think I was talking to somebody on this topic the other day, actually, about you know doing something because somebody tells you to do it is very difficult to do. Mm. Whenever you you hit a sticking point, whereas if you understand the reason why, and you know in the, your case maybe the science and and, uh, and the research behind it, and and the end benefits, and certainly if you're trying it and feeling the benefits, then it becomes a lot easier to stick with it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I've been feeling great too, which is um, which is uh, even better. It's you know, it, it's uh, I, I don't know whether it's you know attributable attributable is that the right way to pronounce that word to to the diet yet or not. But you know, I've I've been back this week, pretty heavy in the training, and been feeling great. Like Monday morning, had a a spin cycle class with the squad, and you know, anecdotally, I feel like I pushed probably harder than I have in a spin class for almost ever and felt pretty good afterwards. I didn't feel ridiculously exhausted or anything like that and I'm not quite sure what what caused that. And, you know, I'd like to think it's part of the diet because that's sort of what uh, a lot of the evidence, you know, says it reduces recovery time and um, uh, makes you feel like all, all, all the benefits that, you know, you, you would kind of assume you would with a healthy diet but, you know, just up a little bit uh, higher without sort of any of the animal proteins which, is, um, which has been really cool. Well, you certainly sound chipper, sir, but uh, as you're now beginning to really make me feel bad and unhealthy, if we could just switch back to the business stuff, I'd feel a lot better. <laughs> All right, sounds good, sounds good. <laughs> Seriously, though, dude, I mean, you, you said you've been uh, reading a lot about this, but uh, have you, when you've been doing your exercise and stuff, have you been uh, doing your usual audible? Have you got any recommendations for us? Yeah, absolutely. The um, I, I still try, you know, the, the, it's a bit interesting, like the, the actual education stuff in terms of really deep diving i still prefer to read so you know i've been reading yep. you know books around the nutrition sort of stuff but when i've been out you know training i still get the usual business sort of stuff um still plowing through arnold schwarzenegger's autobiography still, it, it, it's insane still. it's it's ridiculous <laughs> it's, it's an awesome book but it's ridiculously long and detailed <laughs> It's, um, it's like it's like the best running theme through this podcast like all year. That's like the longest running theme we've had, other than the seven levers. It's we should like have have like an, a special award for Arnold Schwarzenegger for the longest running theme of Pranerka. I think we have to try and get him on the show at some stage, maybe. But um, oh, but in terms good. of you know recent reads that have sort of broken up the um, the Arnold Schwarzenegger story has been a book called Billion Dollar Lessons, and Ooh. it's a it's a really interesting book. It's sort of 
draws on about, I think it's 750 or 800 different business failures. And it kind of talks you through what caused all these businesses to fail. You know, what was the, the issue that, you know, caused this business to go bankrupt and what caused this one to sort of, you know, have to file for bankruptcy but then get out of it and what happened to this one and that one. It's, it's really, really interesting to sort of see, you know, what actually, you know, happens in the negative side of business too because so many people, they read all these positive books and, and all the, you know, the wins and it's almost like, you know, you spend your whole life on Facebook and all you see is people's highlight reels. It's the same sort of thing as well. If you read business books and all you really hear about is the success stories and how easy it is to make it and how this person did so well so easily and blah, blah, blah. But I think it's really important to put things into perspective and actually see that, you know, big companies that are, you know, listed on the stock exchange that are doing, you know, billions of dollars in revenue and turnover can make stupid decisions and go bankrupt. And, you know, they're not immune to this and, you know, these you know, CEOs who are making, you know, $13 million a year in, in salary can do stupid, stupid things and, you know, funnily enough, still get paid their $13 million plus bonuses, but that's a whole other discussion. Oh, it's just yeah. been a really interesting read to sort of, you know, hear some of these lessons and to sort of think, okay, how can I apply them to, to the smaller businesses in comparison to, to these big juggernauts that do things like that? I, that's, that's awesome. I mean, I, you, you made a really good point there that... There's an awful lot of success communication out there. There's also an awful lot of kind of miserable, you know, oh, they, they've failed, kind of highlighting people that have really failed miserably. But it, there's not a lot of constructive dissection of either, you know. I mean, what, what was it Some somebody said, and, and I wish I could remember, I'm hopeless at remembering people who say things, but, but somebody said, um, it only took me 10 years to get an overnight success. Yep, absolutely. You know? Uh, and, and things like that, and it's true, you know. So I, that that's a really interesting. I, I'm I'm going to pick that one up mm. because that, that that kind of thing's really interesting to me. And as you say, there's lessons in everything, uh, as we always say. We always say this on a podcast, you know. Whatever one business is doing in one market sector or niche or whatever, you know, there's a lesson in it for you. Whatever you do, yeah. Um, you know, a classic example is, um, you know, people might know, but I used to work for Xerox. Mm. Um, the at one time the only photocopy company in the world mm. they owned the patent for xerography the, the the technology of making photocopies they owned it um and they did they did spectacularly well because they were the only people that did it but their fundamental mistake was that they kind of stopped paying attention to the fact that the patents run out <laughs> Uh, and literally one second past midnight on the day that the patent ran out, they discovered what happens when you no longer own the only the, the only rights in the world to do something. Um, and th- you notice that now there are not that many Xerox photocopies in the world. There's an awful lot of Canons and Kyoceras and everybody else on the planet. Uh, and competition just overwhelmed them because mm. they just got a bit too, you know, a bit too focused on this one thing and they just let it go. Uh, and there's a lesson there for everybody. <laughs> well, this is the thing, and I think it ties into this episode, and this is something from, I, don't know, I was going to say the, the book jacket, but with an audio book, it doesn't really have a jacket, does it? Particularly one that you no. download from Audible. The cover blurb. The cover blurb, there we go. Well, it says something really, really interesting that I, um, hopefully, well, actually, hopefully listeners will actually realise that this is an underlying theme of our show, and we talk about it quite regularly, and, and definitely it's something we're going to talk about today. But what I say is, the number one cause of failure was misguided strategy, not sloppy execution, poor leadership, or bad luck. I'm going to read that again. The number one cause of failure from these 750 business failures that they actually researched and used in this book, the number one cause was misguided strategy, not sloppy ex- execution, poor leadership, or bad luck. And that's really fascinating to me. Well, it's actually not really overly fascinating to me, but it's really important to me because, again, so many people, they jump straight into execution and they focus on making sure they don't execute poorly and they do the right, the tactics correct. But that doesn't, that's not what causes failure. What causes failure is misguided strategy. And I think... Yep. You know, that's one of the things I've been getting out of this book, or at least having reinforced to me, is that, you know, this happens from all levels, not just startup, you know, entrepreneurs um, who are trying to sort of, you know, get out from working for the man, all the way through to, yeah, these, you know, $35 million 
based CEO salary packaged, you know, to the hilt type people, they still do poor strategy. And it's uh, really, really interesting and it's a really important topic close to my heart, obviously, because we talk about it all on the show. And I want to kind of touch on that in a different way today as well. Cool. And, and, and I, I did, in fact, you know, a couple of episodes ago, talk about exactly that topic, you know, strategy, vision, uh, vision, strategy, and tactics. Um, and strategy is, is a really important thing. And, uh, you know, if so many people get, and I, it was a big part of that episode, uh, go back, folks, and listen to it. I'll put a link in the show notes. But um, a big part of that episode is exactly what you just said. People get wrapped up in, in, in running their business, focusing on implementing tactics. Whether it's the right tactic or not seems to evade a lot of people. In, and and you you know you say the evidence is in this book. They're focusing desperately on implementing this tactic or, or going down this road without evaluating if it's the right road to be going down, right? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. But, but just as a reminder for people, really quickly, we should actually do a call out to our sponsor before we sort of get too much into our topic. Oh, indeed. Is that you know obviously, guys, if you if you want to grab some of these books that we talk about on the show, and we talk about books all the time because it's a, it's a huge. Um, you know, part of, of what we do to, to build up our muscle of, of, of business knowledge. And, you know, Audible is a fantastic service. Uh, audible.com, sorry, not audible.com, audibletrial.com forward slash preneurcast is where you can go and actually get a free audiobook uh, on behalf of Audible. They um, want to support our show and uh, allow you to go there, sign up, and uh, get, you know, a free audiobook and give the whole service a trial. And uh, look, this week's recommendation is clearly uh, billion dollar lessons. Indeed, um, and so Pete, you know, what, you have one of your little hot topics, one of your little soapbox pieces for us. Um, you mentioned <laughs> it briefly to me before the show, um, but what what is it? Well, it's been interesting. I've been doing you know some consulting as I do with with, with certain clients. I want to reach out and sort of you know try and get some support from me, and you know we jump on calls and, and discuss some things. And it's it's been interesting. There's been a little bit of a theme with. Um, first time consults in the last couple of weeks and I don't know whether it's the weather or the, the stars or the moon what it's been but you know people who can't you know want to chat for the very first time they've got a problem uh, and they want me to sort of try and help them through that problem and it's been a consistent problem with every person and they're all in different niches in different parts of the world doing different businesses and this has fundamentally been trying to automate their business or systemize their business before there is any demand to do so Ooh. And it, it's been interesting because let me give you an example. So someone is, is, is selling, uh, selling a service. Um, it doesn't really matter what that service is, but they're selling a service. And what they've done is they've, they've started their business and they've gone out there and they have you know found some really cool automated webinar software. They've seen a sales pitch from some sort of internet marketer about a, an automated webinar software pitch that you can run your business on autopilot. You just throw your leads into this webinar and out pops the other end <laughs> um, a whole bunch of paying clients. And you don't have to actually do any selling and you don't have to do any business. You just sit there and just bank the check. And that's right. all well and good. Okay. That service can do that. There's no question that the actual service works or not. That's not what I'm disputing. What I'm questioning is, I, you know, in conversation with this person, I'm like, oh, how many of these have you sold traditionally? And he was like, oh, about two. So I'm like, okay, so you, 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 you right now, you've got all this free time. Like, you know, question was, the, the question basically went like this, okay, how much time are you willing to invest in your business every week? And the answer was, you know, 30 hours. Okay, cool. So what, how much of that time are you using right now? And the answer was about, oh, you know, 15 hours a week. I'm actually, you know, doing productive stuff. The rest I'm just sort of running around with my head cut off. I'm like, okay, so you've got 15 hours of spare capacity right now, yet you're trying to automate your business and work less. Like, to me, that doesn't make sense. I understand trying to have this lifestyle business with passive income, but passive income doesn't really exist. You know, I think anybody who really has passive, the only people who really have passive income are, you know, authors who write the book once and get paid. But again, the catch is that passive income will dry up pretty quickly if you don't continue to market your book. Um, movie stars, TV actors with, with syndication, but they kind of get passive income because they obviously get money in syndication. However, there's a huge array of people working to keep that show in syndication. So, you know, yes, the actual actor himself might be, but he's going to have a big team around him or other people invested in the success of that, you know, rerun to make money. 
So, you know, in a traditional sense of a small business owner, passive income is very, very hard to come by, you know, without a number of years of hard work. It, it's that 10 years to get an overnight success thing. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, yeah. you know, my, my, my point was, okay, so what's the best way you can sell your service is what I said to him. And, and the, you know, our, actually a few people in, in this different, you know, context. And they're like, well, obviously selling one-to-one. Yeah, there's no question. Selling one-to-one on anything is the best. Whether you're trying to sell a $5 ebook. A two thousand dollar, you know, home security system, or anything in between. The best way to sell is one to one. It's the highest yep. converting thing you'll ever have. Yep. But obviously, you know, there is a there is a limit to how much one on one selling you can do. So once you reach your maximum capacity of, you know, fifteen appointments a week, hypothetically, at that point you need to start working. Okay, how do I maintain my level of sales? my level of income without working extra hours. And it's that it's at that point you start putting automation in. Because if you put automation in beforehand, it's just going to, you know, automating through a, through a webinar, like a, a webinar, is never going to convert as highly. So no. you might go from, let's say, hypothetically, just to make easy numbers, a 50% conversion rate one-to-one to a 5% conversion rate on a webinar. That's a significant drop in conversions. So the only way you're going to sustain your amount of revenue and profit by going to a webinar as opposed to one-on-one is increasing your leads and your traffic by 10. So if you have a business right now where you're maximizing your one-to-one selling, yet you've got 10 times the amount of leads that you can handle, at that point you can say, look, I'm going to be willing to give up this you know, lifestyle of one-to-one selling and automated for the same amount of revenue because that way you know that, hey, all these leads are going to come into the funnel. Yes, I'm going to lose a lot more than potentially would have if I had, you know, more people selling one-to-one. But at the end of the day, my business is going to make the same amount of revenue and I'm going to have a bit more freedom. That makes sense to automate. But starting a business from day one based on a webinar tool, you know, sales letter that sold you on this idea is just silly to automate without the demand for automation. And this has been a really big thing that I've had to actually talk a number of people through over the last three or four weeks. And I know it resonates with a lot of people in the community because in smaller conversations, in group stuff, I've mentioned this and people have, you know, had really big aha moments as well in that, you know, if you're starting at a business and it is a business that is one-to-one, you know, selling security systems, you're actually going to go and install that or you're doing some sort of consulting work, you know, if you're going to deliver the service one-to-one, you should absolutely be selling it one-to-one because you're going to learn about your clientele. You're going to learn what their hot buttons are. You're going to learn what their objections are. You're going to learn how to handle their objections. You're going to convert at the highest rate. And at that point, then automate when you need to, when demand and supply cross, that's when you start going, okay, now I can start automating. Prior to that, when your supply, the amount of time you have to sell and convert and work on your business completely outstrips the demand you have, the amount of leads you have coming in, you should be doing everything you can to maximize every single lead, not try to automate it and lose some leads. You do need to do everything you can on that side of the supply-demand graph when you have more supply than demand. And only when they cross do you start to automate and slowly shift to a more automated system. Does that make sense, Dom? Does that kind of hopefully articulate it to a certain extent? Because it's, it's, it's an interesting topic to sort of talk about loosely like this without sort of diving in and using real-world examples. I mean, I'm, I'm actually looking at it exactly from the implementation point of view because that's my side of the, the, the fence, as it were. Um, and when people talk to me, I again, I have exactly the same thing. And, and But for me as a service provider, um, it actually sounds really, really odd. When people come to me, like, for example, with the automated webinar model, right? An automated webinar needs a webinar. So it needs a lot of material creating to produce the webinar in the first, in the first instance, whether you run it live or whether you run it however. It needs a lot of material creating. And most people, if they're starting from nowhere, they don't know what to create. They don't know the message. They don't know their customer. You know, remember again, a couple of, a couple of episodes ago, I did a foundation episode about know your customer. And you've just said the same thing that 
if you do the sales one-to-one, you know your customer's hot buttons, you know their objections, you know the message and how to craft it. You literally cannot automate anything you can't do mm. yourself. Yeah, and that I mean that's that's the most fundamental thing here. Your metric demand will drive the need for automation. I think is a really great way to visualize it and for people to understand and see the point at which it you you you'll literally know when to automate, when to look for a system or a, a tactic that, that 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 needs to do it. And but but the 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 foundational knowledge, the the real you know, as we talked at the beginning of the show, um, about knowing why, yeah? One of them is the numbers, and I think, again, the maths really speak. You know, if you can convert at 50%, 50% of the people that come to you as a lead, you, by talking to them one-to-one, they become a customer versus the, you know, let's say an optimistic conversion rate on uh, a, a, a webinar where there's no interaction is 5%. They need 10 times more. Mm. Well, please, by the way, anybody, you, if you work out how to increase your leads by 10 times in a short period of time, let me know. I can work for you. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, like, reliably, predictably be able to say, do you know what? Tomorrow I'm just going to go get 10 times more leads. It's not realistic. You know, when we talk about the seven levers, we talk about increasing by 10%. Not 10 times, Mm. 10% because it's realistic, you know. So everything you've said is absolutely spot on that, you know, it it sounds like a really high-level concept, but it's really fundamental and basic. You can't automate what you don't know how to do. You have to do it. You have to work with the clients. You have to know what the message is that you're going to automate. You have all the system. You know, you can't outsource, for example, until you know what it is you're outsourcing. You don't need to necessarily know the mechanics of it, but you need to know what the pieces need to be and how they need to fit together in your strategy, again, as we talked about at the beginning. Mm. Um, but, But, you know, your core point, your core message, that you need to have a demand is just is is I think the most important thing, and I think you really well put by you. Ben. I think it it also comes down to as well a bit of a message to market match, and this this has been interesting. It sort of definitely you know has tied into these conversations I've had in, the, in these consulting sessions. Is that you know they if you're selling to a certain type of customer, let's say for example you're selling social media marketing services. Yeah, you know, this is, isn't one of the clients I had, but it's a pretty prominent industry that I've got my own opinions on, but we won't go down that soapbox um, route right now. But, you know, if you're selling, you know, social media services, you're doing, you know, Facebook ads or you're doing, you know, you know, website development or something, it's making that sort of space to, to, to small to medium businesses. So you're selling to small business owners. Yep. You know, are they just because you are on a mark an email marketing list or internet marketing list and have, you know, been indoctrinated and sold on the you know the value of webinars and you know sales videos and and stuff like that. when you look at some of these numbers like you know the big guru guys they've got like you know a hundred thousand people on their list and they'll do a mail out and yeah they'll make ten thousand dollars but they're only selling to like half a percent of their list so the conversion mm-hmm. rate is terrible that's why they never they never talk about conversion rates they only talk about dollars made because dollars made look sexy when you know if you say I've made ten thousand dollars in an email or hundred thousand dollars in an email. But if you if you email to a thousand people or a hundred thousand people, I mean, like that's actually not that great. So you've got to look at in context. But my point is, just because it for those people with huge lists, what they do to sell to you is not what you should do to sell to your clients. So if they, you know, are saying go and do these sales videos, do you really think a owner of the local lawn mowing service or the scuba dive shop or the bakery around the corner has ever been on a go-to webinar or a automated webinar or watched a sales video that goes for half an hour. You know, the chances are probably not. You know, this is the thing, again, you've got to get out from the world that you live in and think about your customer and make sure you've got the right message to market match. So again, you know, 
a friend of mine, well, not very well, a client of mine slash friend of mine, he was doing you know consulting services to business owners, and he was trying to get them to watch a sales video that went for forty five minutes. And I'm like, okay, so the service he was selling was like productivity, uh, you know, make your business more efficient type consulting service. A great, amazing service. But the way he was trying to sell it was through getting people to watch a 45-minute video. And it's like, well, hang on. Your clients are coming to you to use you because they're, they're, they're too overwhelmed and busy. How the hell are you going to make the pitch to get them to actually spend 45 minutes in front of a video whilst they're sitting there at their desk getting in, bombarded by their, their assistant and email dinging and their mobile phone ringing? How are they going to turn that off for 45 minutes? It's not going to oh, happen. You, you, saw, you stole my thunder on that. I was going to come down on that like a ton of bricks. But it's just funny. And this is the thing is so many people do it. And I, I really yeah, encourage people as we're kind of, you know, getting to the end of the 2013 and, you know, moving towards 2014, Take a moment and just really take a moment and think, okay, who am I selling to? Yep. How am I selling to them? Yep. Because how you were sold it will, won't always sell them. And so many people just take what they were used to sell and then just roll out to somebody else. And it's just, you know, it's not going to work. Um, so, you know, yep. what we're doing next year is we're changing our complete business model. And we'll, you know, we'll share some of our plans um, in the next few weeks um, about what we're doing with Preneur. We're going to still keep the podcast, don't worry. But there's a lot of stuff we're changing next year in terms of how we're helping um, the community members, what we're going to be doing. Because I think there's some, some better ways that not only we can help people, but we can reach people in a better way and um, make it a better revenue source for the business um, and help everyone along the way. But it's just it's been an interesting last couple of months, you know, dealing with these one on one consults. So I've been really loving it and, and you know, the feedback's been amazing and people have, you know, revolutionized their business and feeling the most confident they've felt in a very long time. Which is great because, you know, intuitively they they knew this was wasn't right and they just sort of believed the sales letter so much. And this is why copywriting is so important because they believed <laughs> in the sales letter that they bought so much. They weren't willing to let go of a failing tactic or a failing tactic and change their strategy. I mean, you you really are reflecting what I what I rounded up at the end of the the vision strategy tactics episode uh, a couple of weeks ago with this point. You know, it, it's another way of looking at demand, yeah, mm. it, it, and knowing your customer again, foundational stuff. When you realise and understand who your customer is, you'll know what in what format they want to receive things. You'll know what they respond to. You'll know where they're looking for advertising, where, they will, where they'll see your adverts. Um, and I think your example was really, really good. You know, a productivity expert who's marketing to stressed out people who are time poor, using up 45 minutes of their day mm. with his sales message. I, I mean, you know... He, Every every aspect of that is just just is you know with the best will in the world whoever the chap is you know it screams not paying attention to your customers mm. uh, but you know it's not it's like if you take it apart and go how do I market to time poor people with really short messages is the answer mm. <laughs> um, or you know you lock them in a room face to face for twenty minutes so they can't get distracted while you pitch them there's that one too yeah it's like and. But but what you don't do is make and and that so it really screams to me that that person was sold a silver bullet, mm. and you know as I said again uh, in the tactics episode, you know so many people and and you said at the beginning and this is like full circle to what you said about the book you know the the billion dollar, billion dollar lessons, a lot of businesses fail because people get sucked into tactics. Yeah, they focus on tactics. They're not the right tactics, um, you know. And it, they could be, you know, one of the points I made in the tactics episode is it might, what well, it might not be the right tactic for your audience, but it also might not be the right tactic for you. Mm. You know, if if you don't have the skill to do it, or you don't have the money to do it, you know, because that's one again one of the things with these automated webinar systems or video sales letters or whatever, they're not cheap. You've got to, you know, you maybe got to invest in a system, or you've got to hire somebody to produce it for you because it's outside your skill base or whatever. And if you are, if you genuinely are doing it, you know, because you think you should, or someone told you you should, because that's what they're selling this week, you really have to stand back and do the numbers and go, look, I'm taking a phone call, I'm converting 50% of people, 
I'm bringing money in. Should I really be spending money that I don't necessarily have right now on this system, on this supposed solution? Mm. You know. Um, so yeah, it's, it's I, like I, it really does fit. You, it's it's awesome that you've been reading that book. Um, you know, the billion dollar lessons, and and came got that message from it because it really does. You know, it fits completely with this idea, and I, I can totally support what you said. You know, I get people come to me with exactly the same situation. Oh, I'm, I want help implementing this tactic with the best will in the world, even though it's going to lose me this particular piece of work. No, you don't. Mm. Stop it now. Stop trying to implement that tactic. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> please, please, I, I can't take your money. Go away. Yeah. Well, well yeah. I'd, what I'd love to do is actually just sort of relate this back a little bit, sort of the seven levers, and also kind of give people a bit more structure of, of what they should be doing to start reassessing for, for towards 2014. And one of the things we did do recently um, for our platinum group in a in a in a, one of the coaching calls we had there, we actually had a whole session on business models and you know getting your business oh, model yeah. right for 2014. And I, I think I want to turn that into a webinar. So. Um, I won't go down that path directly right now, but nope. if you're interested and you feel a little bit lost about what your business model is and, and what you should be doing in 2014, make sure you yep. keep an eye out on the blog and make sure you are part of our email community, which you can join over at preneurmarketing.com. So we'll run a webinar, I think, and rehash some of the stuff we spoke about in that Q&A call into a really yep. solid plan for people. But relating what we're speaking about today to a bit of a plan, what I think people should absolutely be doing, and hopefully people already have got this first element already done and this is sit down write out the seven levers and what each of those levers look like for your business and maybe you've got a few different business divisions and a few different business units so you're going to have multiple different funnels or seven levers you know streams or frameworks that in itself should be a bit of an eye opener if you sit down and go okay i've got an ebook and here's my seven levers process for, for selling the ebook and i make money through affiliate marketing on my blog by writing articles then these are different seven levers, obviously, for, for maximizing the revenue from that particular stream. Maybe you've got a, a digital magazine. That's a different seven levers, obviously. That in itself should be a big eye-opener going, holy crap, I've got 17 different business units trying to run here and none of them are profitable. That in itself yeah, should be a big eye-opener. And there's just me. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> we'll cover that sort of stuff in the in the, the webinar we do because that was kind of a big key yeah. topic from, from what we spoke about. But the first thing is you know, pick the main core business that you run or what you're trying to run here and write down what are each of the seven levers right now what are you doing right now to increase traffic what do you have right now that is your your conversion engine what is it you're doing so maybe it is a automated webinar maybe it's a sales letter maybe it's a, a sales video whatever it might be you know what is your opt-in strategy what is your strategy to get people to come and buy again and just write that down. So you sh this is the foundation stuff you'd obviously hopefully already have and be very, very clear on what your seven levers look like. From there, what I want you to do, this is this week's homework, so to speak. Um, you know, since I've been doing my Cornell University course, I'm back into the homework kind of uh, regime. So I'm going to give some to you guys. And what it is, is okay, put that aside now. Put out, put aside what you are currently trying to work on or what you've got going and just take a moment and go, if you had time freedom, what would be the things you would do for each one of those seven levers that would absolutely maximize them? Not just increase it by 10%, would absolutely maximize it. So the obvious example, which I think you know people hopefully have drawn already from this episode and this conversation, is if right now your conversion engine for some sort of service or product to a certain extent is an automated webinar, a sales page, a sales video, something like that, Obviously, the highest thing you can do to convert is a one-to-one -one sales pitch. Jumping on the phone, you know, getting people to schedule a call with you, jumping on the phone for half an hour and selling them that $2,000 home study course or even selling them that $20 ebook. You know, realistically, you know, that should be a pretty easy sale off the back of a half-hour conversation. That's the most highest converting thing you can do. So just look and, you know, you're wanting to hypothetically increase repeat customers. Have someone call a customer a week later and sell them and, and talk to them. What Have you used a product? What haven't you used about it? What do you like about it? Do you want some more support? Do you want to buy a high-end product? Do you want some consulting? Whatever it might be. And just start looking at what are the things you could be doing if you resources wasn't an issue or you know your blinders weren't an issue or you know your previous actions and investments such as a course on video sales letters and things like that 
isn't hamstring you because you feel like you have to use that. If you move it all that aside and go, okay, I'm clean slating this, what is it the best thing you can do for each one of those levers to profitize and maximize your business? And I think just that process for a lot of people will be extremely eye-opening because you'll realize there's a huge gap between what is the best thing to maximize your time, maximize the client's time, maximize the message to market match, all those sort of things compared to what you are doing or what you are trying to do right now. And somewhere in that gap, you will realize where you should actually be. And I think when I've done that with so many people in these consulting sessions, it's worked ridiculously well, been a huge eye-opener for them, a huge relief for them, and a huge confidence builder moving into next year as well, which is very exciting. Cool, cool. I have to say, I mean, the one the one thing that that really got a lot of reaction from people that I've seen do the, do this activity, you know, when we've done it live or, you know, in workshops or whatever with people, when you do the seven levers and you go, okay, everything like your your automated webinar and your website and your ebook and your whatever every one of those is a funnel so start at the top with where's the traffic come for that and people just it really does highlight to people the potential complexity the potential diverse nature of all the different elements of things that at some point they have to be you know the plates that they're spinning if you want that metaphor mm. um so it is that in alone is a great exercise but that that the differential the addition of the differential is another great thing to just give people some awareness uh, of this of the situation and the opportunities um and the other thing i would like to say folks um as pete says you know um Pete, really, you know, we we do need. To, I think I, de- I think we definitely need to focus on um, re redoing that that consulting call, the the platinum call that we did on the the planning um, for everyone, um, because it, it got such a fantastic response from the platinum members. Uh, really was really well received, and I think it's a really valuable thing that we can do for everybody. So, folks, as Pete said, if you're not already on uh, the mailing list, the general kind of printer, Preneur um, community uh, mailing list uh, over at preneurmarketing.com just pop over um, and sign up because we'll be letting people know um, when it's done I'm going to put a positive constraint on that Pete because if people sign up and are expecting that we're going to have to deliver it so absolutely I'm kind of committing us to that but do drop over there while you're over there do remember folks that that's the place that you can get all the past episodes that we link to there's all the show notes the transcripts of all the shows uh, of Preneurcast and lots of other cool stuff. There's all Pete's essays and things on uh, preneurmarketing.com as well. You can leave us a comment on any episode. We love your feedback. You can also leave us comments on our iTunes channel. Uh, just search, search for Preneurcast over on iTunes and we'd love to get feedback there as well. And if you go to the website, you can also leave us one of those really cool audio messages in general. So uh, looking forward to hearing from you folks um, and I will make sure that Pete and I get that webinar done in short order for you so that you can start 2014 in a really positive way. Absolutely. All right, guys, make sure you check out Billion Dollar Lessons from audibletrial.com forward slash preneurcast, and we will see you and speak to you and uh, hopefully support you some more next week. been enjoying another fine episode of Preneurcast with Pete Williams and Tom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.preneurmarketing.com or drop them a line via Preneurcast at preneurgroup.com.